everybody. Thanks for joining Border City Rock Talk, where you get the best news and interviews. Uh, I've got some big interviews coming up, so hit that subscribe button. That's going to go across the right hand of your screen, the guitar logo. Um, I don't want to waste too much of my guest's precious time, so I'm going to introduce him now. He is uh, he was Derek Smalls, and this is Final Tap. Um, he writes, well, excuse me, I got that wrong. He's the voice of a few Simpsons characters. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can. I'm doing. I'm semaphoring to my wife. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is awesome. So, and uh, Harry does a lot more. So, yes, Harry Shearer, who I've got on uh, board now, and uh, welcome, Harry. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I wanted to bring you on for a couple of reasons. I interviewed one of your friends, Paul Shortino, recently about this is Spinal Tap, <laughs> and. Uh, Paul had let me know that it's not too long, well, a few years ago, you and Paul Schaefer and him and a few others did uh, an improv sort of a thing with Big Bottom at the Caesar. At the Caesar? Caesar Palace. You guys did Big Bottoms. Oh. Um, hmm. Okay. Yeah, you were there because I saw it on YouTube, so. <laughs> All right. Must be true. So uh, anyways, yeah, thanks for joining me. Um, getting, starting off with a little bit of Spinal Tap-ish, I know uh, Derek um, grew up, uh, and one of his first jobs was actually something that's come to fruition these days, the idea of sanitizing. I guess I guess Derek's first job was a phone hand sanitizer at 17, is that right? Well, his, his, his dad had a firm called Sanifone. In, yeah. in the post-war in the post-war era, Britain's people in Britain were uh, highly... Um, Oh, well, I shouldn't say paranoid, but they were concerned about the uh, how uh, how safe it was to use this handset, uh, which other mouths were talking into. Mm -hmm. Sounds like contemporary America. So yeah. there were these these companies that would go about with little trucks and sanitize your phone every week. And uh, Derek joined his dad, you know, as soon as he could hop in the van uh, to do that kind of work. Uh, and he's often speculated that if his dad had lived long enough, um, he could have had a uh, a phone app that you know for the for this thing that yeah. uh, would sanitize itself and would have made a million dollars or pounds. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, and then uh, I guess uh, reading, um, I've been a big fan of Derek for years. Um, I was reading that uh, uh, he attended uh, London. School school um, of design but uh i guess he dropped out because he was offended by the initials lsd no he right? joined he he enrolled because of the initials oh that's what <laughs> he wasn't really an art student but you know london school of design sounded psychedelic to him and then uh from there um he went in to join a band called uh like a reggae band called um scoffy scoff, scoff, yeah well pr predecessor of reggae was scoff yeah. This was the first, I mean, I, I, as far as I know, the only all-white ska band uh, in Britain, uh, ska face, and uh, that's that's what he was doing when uh, Spinal Tap beckoned. And then the other thing I wanted to note on, which I found great, was um, uh, Derek was in a band called Lamb's Blood, a, a metal band. And um, well, when, when when Spinal Tap broke, one of the many times that Spinal Tap broke up. Yeah. Uh, he was recruited by a uh, a metal Christian band, a hard yeah. rock, called Lamb's Blood, and they had uh, they they did, had one song that charted on the Christian charts called "A Whole Lot of Lord." Yeah, yeah, I, I heard that it uh, it charted on the very 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 independent Christian charts. Yeah, yeah, got up to number twenty five, I think, which is which is good for Christian. Yeah, for sure. So anyways, that was great. I remember the band Stri Striper and everything. So, uh, yeah. Now, the story, as long as we're there, um, having come from a, you know, hard rock metal style band, Derek had to prove to his uh, mates in the in the Lamb's Blood that he, you know, was now of the faith. And he had gotten a uh, one of those, you know, fish tattoos that the christian bands uh, often have yeah um and then when spinal tap beckoned back they looked askance at that tattoo so he went back to his artist and um then had a devil eating the fish so it worked out all right 
so so for some of my viewers askance means they look down upon i'm just letting them know so <laughs> you speak very well so uh harry yeah so let's get into the uh, kind of uh, contemporary questions I, I know you've been asked a few times um but I'm gonna, i'll ask them because some of my viewers uh both of them might not uh, know um has there been any kind of reunions? I'm sure there has. Uh, reunions with uh, many of the cast members from This Is Final Tap? Uh, cast members, um, not necessarily. Everybody uh, sort of went off and, and, you know, did their wonderful own things, uh, particularly, um, you know, uh, the actress who went on to fame as the nanny, uh, Fred Drescher. Right? Uh, Fred Willard, who's done, you know, who did uh, an amazing number of wonderful things before he passed away last year. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I would see Fred on occasion uh, in L.A. when I was in L.A., but uh, I don't think we ever worked together. Well, you know, Fred participated. Uh, my wife, Judith Owen, and I do a, uh, have been doing a Christmas show every year and touring it. Uh, and when we do it in LA, uh, Fred would participate in that and did this wonderful, uh, just totally goofy piece called The True Story of Christmas. So in, in that sense, I, I reunited with him then. Um, and of course, um, Michael McCain and Christopher Guest and I uh, reunited to, to uh, perform as another uh, band, a folk band called The Folksman for the movie The Mighty Wind, uh, in Mighty Wind, sorry. Uh, so in that sense, we, we, uh, reunited. So no, what, what I think I meant was, was there ever a reunion organized, like a high school reunion where everybody got together for the night? Uh, no. No. Okay. Well, yeah, you're all, you're all busy for sure. So, um, I'm looking at your bio. I didn't really need to, but I mean, I thought I would just look a little deeper and, uh, mm. for the people that aren't aware, I mean, you grew up in, a, in, a in a entertainment industry family uh, you were the first eddie haskell and leave it to beaver actually you're in the pilot of it correct that's right that's right but uh, i didn't grow into a show business family my oh. family oh. had nothing to do with show business oh, I'm sorry. Uh, but when i was seven i was uh, sort of recruited uh into the business uh a, a woman who had been my piano teacher became a, a children's agent and uh offered to get me some work and my parents went Okay, and the next thing they knew, I was in, in the business. Wow, and I mean, that business has carried you far with uh, being a satir satirist, uh, radio, podcast, actor, director, um, bass, you know, musician, what have you. I mean, you've been on the Jack Benny show. Um, uh, what was, what were you on the um, um, Alfred Hitchcock Presents for? I was an actor. I was a, you know, I, I, I was a working actor, working child actor, so about half the year I'd, I'd be off in various jobs. And one of them was an episode of Alf Alfred Hitchcock Presents, which was a, uh, a series hosted by the great uh, film director, Alfred Hitchcock. But uh, each week it was a different story and a different cast. So it was what was called in those days an anthology show. And I was on one of the episodes of it. Wow. So uh, just, uh, just backing up a bit, um... Why, why do you think that there hasn't been a uh, sequel or a documentary to follow up? This is Final Tap. Um, was there talks or was it uh, they, you know, everybody just said, you know what, we'll leave it at that? Um, up to now, it's been sort of the latter. Yeah. Um, um, you know, we, we felt we'd kind of hit the jackpot in terms creatively. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I should point out creatively. Um, with that film and uh you know there's been a certain hesitation to see uh, to uh take the chance of seeing if if we could get that lucky uh, again um we'll see well and the other thing too is i'm sure you're aware obviously that if you go in to do the second one and, and it's a flop it might um you know bring down the first one i you know what i mean in that sort of way well, I would hope not, but, you know, there's yeah. always that. Well, you got Friday the 13th, part 36. So, I mean, <laughs> well, we're not going to do that. No, that's what I'm saying. So, yeah, that's uh, that's great. Um, 
everybody knows that you're uh, the voice of the Simpsons, and I know that some of them you're not doing now, but uh, just give the uh, viewers um, uh, just a rundown of the voices uh, that you've done over the past for the Simpsons. Um, well, I, I, I can remember some of them. Uh, Mr. Burns, Smithers, Principal Skinner, Ned Flanders, Reverend Lovejoy, uh, Scratchy, uh, <laughs> Kent Brockman, uh, are a few of them. Yeah, there's there's only one I'm not doing now, and uh, yeah, Hebert, Doctor Hebert. Yes. Yeah. Uh, did did you do um, Otto? Yes, I oh. still do. Otto, I want to get Blotto. Yeah. So mm -hmm. um, when you were reading scripts for the uh, Simpsons, um, uh, is there one that you can, I know this is really quick, really just putting it on you, Harry. Um, is there one or a couple that when you read the script, you, you laughed because it's in paper or, you know, email or whatever. It, well, I mean, um, when I first read a script, it's when we're doing the read through of the show, which is a, the cast is all together either physically or now uh virtually and uh i don't i don't usually see the script before we do that read through um and when we're doing the read through we're trying to get all the way through the the episode uh without interruption so um there's not really uh room for laughter um but certainly uh, the shows, the couple of episodes that I look back on as standouts, in my opinion, were uh, in season three, uh, when Mr. Burns ran for public office. That's, it's also known as the Three-Eyed Fish episode. Yeah. And then I think it's in season nine, when Homer takes, the, uh, uh, takes a psychedelic and encounters uh, a creature voiced by Johnny Cash. Yeah. Uh, I think was about the most beautiful half hour of animation I've ever seen on television. Wow. Wow. So um, moving forward, I know that, um, you know, you're, you're heavy, heavy into politics. Um, yeah. Not running for office, not running for office. No, you're not. No, I don't mean that. I just mean that you're very vocal on your politi political views. What I was getting at earlier before we went on, um, a couple of years ago, I'd interviewed you by phone and this is what happened. You're very generous when I, asked you via Twitter, couldn't believe that you answered. I said, hey, is there any chance of getting an interview, Harry? And you said, contact my publicist, okay? Mm -hmm. So I did, and they went through the Canadian publicist and through your other publicist. I think he was in the UK for some reason, I don't know. So mm -hmm. then you had a phone interview, and I touched on Spinal Tap and The Simpsons, and at the very end, I brought in, is there anything you want to say to your Canadian viewers? And you said, don't make the same mistake we did. Okay, so this is during the Trump uh, issues. Ah, so, yes. Uh, after that, I've never received a terse email from any of the management or publicist teams, but I did get one, and it was polite, but it was, Harry's team wasn't very happy with the interview. I'm like, why? He goes, well, you didn't bring up politics. I'm like, you, you, you never bring up politics in an interview unless they're requested. So the confusion was you were going through a public, a public campaign to promote the many sides of Donald Trump. And that was your whole cycle of interviews. Many moods, the, ma the many moods of Donald Excuse Trump. Me, the many moods. And that was the cycle of interviews that were being thrown out. So mm -hmm. you had interpreted, and so did your publicity team, that that's what the interview was about. I had no effing clue, Harry. And so when I got back to them, I said, hey, tell Harry, I'm sorry, but I mean, I didn't know. I was just thought it was just a friendly interview. So that was the funny thing that we had a couple years ago. Well, listen, here's a note about show business. There's no such thing as just a friendly interview. Well, okay, well, you're, I consider you a friend, whether you consider me one or not. So. No, I'm just saying. <laughs> I know, I know. Inter I know. Interviews are set up at certain times and not yeah. at others. Yeah. And it, that's supposed to coincide with something that's on sale to the general public. I get it. Absolutely. I mean, you're giving me something and I'll give you something back. And I want you to let, let everybody know. Well, first of all, the many moods of Donald Trump, 2020. Um, you released that uh, that album, so people should check it out. Um, <laughs> so, what, do you, what what have you got going on right now? I know you're a very very busy man. I'm not a very very busy man at the moment because of this thing called COVID. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm doing The Simpsons uh, all through this period, and I also do a my long running radio show, which is basically a place where. 
uh, unlike The Simpsons, I get to do my own satirical slant on what's going on in the world. Um, and that's been going on for oh, longer than The Simpsons on uh, radio in the States and uh, on now as a podcast. Uh, it's called Le Show. Um, but I have other projects that are sort of on the back burner until uh, old Mr. COVID is through with us. Um, they, just, they just can't be uh, logistically put together. One is a, a film and uh, the other is a, uh, which I'm get, starting to do the adaptation on. I, I wrote a comic novel a few years ago and we're uh, going to adapt it for uh, a limited series on one of the streaming channels. Uh, so that that's mainly what I'll be doing for the next little while. So you're saying there's, a, you know, quite a bit of limitations. Um, what's the scene in, in Louisiana right now? I mean, with uh, restrictions and... Uh... Uh, well, I mean, uh, New Orleans, you know, there's, first of all, there's a very big difference between Louisiana and New Orleans. Okay. Um, culturally, this is a whole different place from the rest of the state. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's open for business. That is to say, <clears throat> you can go to clubs and see music being performed live which wasn't yeah. true uh three or four months ago yeah. but um the, the numbers here are bad as they are in california or other places around the country in terms of cases less so hospitalizations but um you know i'm i'm uh, just there's not a lot of um affection at the moment for getting into a small room with a bunch of other people at least on my part. Right. Um, so, you know, and that's a lot of, <clears throat> a lot of production and, and stuff tends to uh, focus on that kind of activity. So. Yeah. It's, 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 uh, it's tough for sure. Um, before I let you go. Um, so you do um, a few of the voices you can do Trump and that sort of thing. Actually, I, I know that you're, you're one of the best Trump impersonators out there um have you got hopefully there won't be any call for that again um <laughs> but uh i one thing i i am really proud of from that era was um uh, um you mentioned that record and i did a couple of videos uh, yeah. of the song from that record I saw that. and i uh, have gotten over the years you know done a lot of projects where i appear as other people and where heavy makeup and it's just uh, thought god there's got to be an easier way than that for sitting in a chair for four hours getting makeup done <laughs> and there's a relatively new um technology called motion capture animation um that i've been really interested in and for so for that record i did two music videos um the the one that i'm really proudest of is called executive time where i appear as trump pretty eerily and it's oh, called was... with motion capture animation. It's it's on YouTube and uh, it's yeah. three minutes and it's I, I would love people to see it. I'll put that link down definitely be below the description Great. bar. I almost forgot uh, the most important question um, that I've been thinking about for two days. Um, when you were um, making the film, this is Spinal Tap. Can you give us a scene where, because I know it's improv. When we talked before, I thought it was um, kind of... Um, ad-libbed or whatever but i mean i couldn't believe um you, you know people could act that perfectly from a script you you definitely would know and you told me it was improv you taught me that so is there one scene and this is spinal tap or two where everybody just broke out burst out laughing after you did your scene and the director yelled cut the director rob reiner um yeah i mean first of all there's a, a big difference between ad-libbing and improvising right uh, and it can be best summed up as <clears throat> ad-libbing is talking and improvising is about listening. Um, okay. You are responding to what you've just heard. Right. Uh, as to, I got this great joke and I'm going to say it now. Um, so there is that distinction. But yes, the, uh, I think it's fair to say that the scene where uh, Fred Willard, the aforementioned Mr. Willard, is uh, at our host in an Air Force base and is uh, as uncomfortable as a human being can be, except the discomfort that he then uh, puts us through. Um, and it, it, I've never been in any scene with Fred Willard where I didn't 
explode with laughter after the director yelled cut and all of us had that same reaction it was just we you're never really prepared for what uh, fred willard would come up with um and and it, that was a great example of it and we all just broke so broke you, totally what was it that he said he said you know we'll get you on early so we can get you out here was that something what it was the whole thing it was yeah. just the whole you know is i'm a big fan of yours not not your band <laughs> <laughs> the genre you know all, all that stuff it was just a, a succession of absurdities that came rolling at us and uh at the end it was we just had to explode with laughter that's awesome um yeah i appreciate your time i'm gonna ask you uh, because this is going out to uh well no i shouldn't even say that i've got a i've got uh, you know many many american uh, viewers and youtube uh <laughs> subscribers as canadians but um I'm going to ask you, I'm going to say Principal Skinner, but I mean, you can answer in your own voice, but um, your favorite Canadian band, Skinner, I want an answer. <laughs> uh, the Pursuit of Happiness. Yes, that's right. We talked about that a couple years ago. Yes. And, I like uh, that. I like Mo Berg a lot. Yeah, I don't know uh, if he's still um, performing. I don't know either, but um, I, I know he's still alive. Um, but I, I was a big fan of that band. And you know, it was a double, double kind of thing because I thought that band was also a great example of what a good uh, producer Todd Rundgren is. Oh yeah. Uh, he produced at least a couple of their records. I have no idea if it was fun working with him, but I, you know, just sonically the result uh the, the way those records sounded i really liked wow hey harry i'd like to thank you very much for your time today i'd like to thank uh pam uh mr burns <laughs> um your your wife for helping setting this up um yeah everybody's looking forward to hearing from you and um keep up the great work we're all big simpsons fans you know what i watched spinal tap to be honest with you probably about 50 times now it's a cult classic <laughs> thank you thanks i appreciate Take care and have a great day, my friend. You friends. too. Thanks. Bye-bye.